All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Be sure to check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. The link is in the comments below. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A behavior analyst is asked to complete an FBA and to bring a behavior technician along with them. The behavior analyst takes on the role of interviewing the parents and asks the technician to make a tally mark each time the child flaps their hands or stomps their feet. What is the behavior analyst asking the technician to do? Starting with a pretty straightforward measurement question. And as always, when we get straightforward or relatively easy questions, we don't overthink them or panic. We just simply trust our prep, answer it, and move on. So the question is asking, what is the behavior analyst wanting the technician to do? Well, we know the behavior analyst is completing an FBA and the tech goes with them. Behavior analyst is interviewing the parents and wants the technician to make a tally mark each time the child flaps their hands or stumps their feet. So what kind of measurement is the technician using? Are they measuring time? Are they measuring an amount? Well, they're measuring an amount, right? They're measuring how many times the child flaps their hands. And that's a good question to ask yourself when you're going through measurement questions. Am I looking at time or an amount? And if I'm making a tally mark each time flapping hands occurs or stomping feet occurs, I'm simply counting how many times these behaviors happen. And so what type of measurement does the behavior analyst want? A, recording rate. Rate does include frequency, right? But it also needs a time component. We don't have a time component in our question. We're not asking the technician to use a time component. We're simply looking at tally marks. Now, could we convert that later to rate? We could if we wanted to add time. But as the question is written, the only thing the technician is using are tally marks to record how many times the behavior happens. And so what they're doing is B, event recording. Now, event recording is pretty much frequency. And event recording happens during direct assessments, during functional behavior assessments, and we're just recording how many times the event occurs. And so if our events are flapping hands and stopping feet, well, we're making tally marks to count how many times those events happen. We're not using interval recording because for interval recording, we need intervals, right? And we don't have intervals here. We just have our tally marks and the responses. So it's a very, very simple and straightforward measurement procedure. And then record into response time. So into response time would be time in between flapping hands, time in between stomping feet, but that's not what we're recording either. We're simply making a tally mark each time the response occurs. And therefore the technician is using event recording to record flapping of hands and stomping of feet. Very straightforward measurement question. We answer it, we move on. A behavior analyst is in the process of training a staff of five technicians for a day treatment program that uses a specific curriculum and schedule each day. The behavior analyst wants to monitor how closely the technicians are following the curriculum and schedule and wants to identify areas for improvement. Which of the following answer choice would likely produce the most objective data for the analyst goals? All right, long question, but that's okay. We're going to spend our time understanding the question before going to the answer choice. Now, we're looking for the answer choice that's going to produce the most objective data. And when we talk about objective, what do we mean? Well, we want data or we want data on what actually occurred, right? And so when we talk about objective, we're talking about not opinionated and what actually happened. When we get into subjective data, we're talking much more along the lines of indirect data or self-reported data, data that comes along with a lot of bias and a lot of opinion. We want objective data here where we don't have bias, we don't have opinion, we are simply recording what happened. And so if this behavior analyst is training this staff and they are training on a curriculum and a schedule and they're trying to monitor, so it's a monitor, it's a staff or personnel monitoring question, they're trying to monitor how closely technicians are following the curriculum and schedule to try to find out where we can improve. How can we do that objectively? So two things. What is the goal? The goal is to monitor how closely technicians are following the curriculum and schedule for improvement. And two, 
we want objective data. So A, the technicians use a checklist to record their own behavior throughout the day. Now, this would give us daily data, but what's the issue? The issue is it's self-reported. Now, self-reported isn't necessarily bad, right? It's just, could we be more objective than having someone report themselves or report on their own behavior? Sure, because if you're reporting on your own behavior, it comes along with a lot of bias, probably a lot of social implications, a lot of work implications. And so can we be more objective than A? B, the technicians sit down with the analysts at the end of each week and talk about their day. Now, B is much more subjective than A because B is relying on this anecdote data where the technicians are simply giving basically an interview about how the week went or how their day went. And that's not going to be as objective as actually recording it using a checklist. So A is still better than B. C, the analyst records the behavior of each technician two days a week on a checklist. Now, C isn't as frequent as A, but it is going to be more objective because the analyst is recording the behavior of each technician. Now, there's always going to be some level of bias in data collection. It just happens, right? But at least with C, the person or the technician isn't recording their own behavior. The analyst can objectively sit back and take their checklist and observe all the behaviors of the technician. In addition, the analyst knows how they want their curriculum and schedule done. So the analyst can be much more precise in how they are measuring and assessing the curriculum and schedule implementation. So C is going to be better than A. And then D, the analyst reviews the client data at the end of the week. Now, could it be possible where the curriculum and schedule were not implemented correctly and the client data were still good? Sure. So D is not going to be as good as C. Notice how we went through each answer choice, explained why one answer was wrong and another was correct. That's how you want to approach each practice question. And even on, the, on, on test day, you want to read every single answer choice and tell yourself, why is this one wrong? Why is this one right? That's going to increase your fluency. It's going to increase your speed and it's going to increase your accuracy. You just passed your exam and are now certified as a behavior analyst. You start a new job that pays well and offers you great hours. Your new boss adds you to the company website with a brief description of your role. The description states that you offer sensory integration therapy in conjunction with applied behavior analysis. Is this ethical? So we just have a to the point ethics question. And the question is specifically asking, is this scenario ethical? Well, what do we know about the scenario? We know you're now certified as a behavior analyst. You are a BCBA. And so you have to abide by the ethics code. You start a new job. It pays well, offers you great hours. And this is part of the challenge of being ethical. When you're in a good situation, it can be challenging to be ethical because you might be sacrificing hours, you might be sacrificing a job, your pay, but you have to always remain ethical regardless of those things. If your new boss adds you to the company website and says that you offer sensory integration therapy, is that ethical? How would we approach this situation? A, yes, behavior analysts often deal with the sensory needs of clients. Well, stating you offer a specific type of therapy and us dealing with needs of clients are two different things. If we're talking a specific type of service, we can't just say we offer this service unless we are competent and qualified to give that service. So B, no, you should not provide any other therapy to clients. Well, that's not necessarily true. As long as you're working in the confines of ethics and regulations and the law, if you are, let's say, a speech pathologist and a BCVA, there's absolutely nothing wrong with giving both of the clients as long as you're working within the rules and the regulations and ethics. C, it depends on if you are certified and competent in sensory integration therapy. Absolutely. You have to be certified and competent in this type of therapy to claim that you can do this type of therapy. You can't just state on a website, we offer sensory integration therapy because you have a quote unquote sensory room. This is a specific service that needs to be vetted and you have to have someone certified and competent. And then D, it does not matter. You're not responsible for statements you did not make. And this is where the specific ethical code comes in. 
the ethics code states that you, the behavior analyst, are responsible for public statements about you, even ones you don't make. And this is a good example of why. You didn't write the description, your boss did, but you're still responsible for what your boss is saying about you and telling people about you. And so is it ethical? Well, it just depends. Are you certified and competent in this type of therapy? If you are, there's nothing wrong. If you aren't, you need to have it removed. Jones takes his cauliflower and throws it on the floor. His mom tells him to go to his room immediately with no dessert. Jones is now throwing cauliflower and green beans on the floor. Sending Jones to his room likely functions as blank. All right. Pretty straightforward question. Pretty straightforward consequence question. Let's think about our behavior and what we're looking at and what the question wants to know about and wants to know about sending Jones to his room. So we're looking at this consequence, right? Because Jones takes the cauliflower, throws it on the floor. That's the, the response. And as the consequence, his mom makes him go to his room immediately with no dessert. And so when we're looking at consequences and identifying what type of consequence it is, we're always looking at how it affects the future behavior. If the consequence increases future behavior, it's reinforcement. If it decreases, it's either punishment or extinction. In this case, Jones throws cauliflower, gets into his room. He's now throwing cauliflower and green beans. So how did the behavior change in the future? Well, it increased and something was even added. So going to the room has functioned as A, reinforcement. Remember, the consequence is not about the topography. It's not about our traditional technologies. It's about how it affects future behavior. If Jones threw the cauliflower and got sent to his room and then stopped throwing cauliflower, that would be punishment. It's all we're looking at. How does it affect future behavior? It's not extinction because we're, we're, we are adding or removing something to the environment. Remember, punishment and extinction are separate. There are two different consequences. Punishment is adding or removing something. Extinction is withholding. And then D, non-contingent reinforcement. Well, non-contingent reinforcement is an antecedent strategy. And here we have a consequence strategy, so it can't be D. Sending Jones to his room functions as reinforcement. Very straightforward question. We answer it. We move on. Which inter-observer agreement strategy is considered the strictest in terms of IOA agreement? All right, inter-observer questions can be challenging because there are many types, and we just don't talk about them a lot. And so when we're thinking about the strictest IOA, we're talking about what strategy is going to be the most difficult to agree on in terms of two people taking data. Now, we have mean count per interval, trial by trial, exact count, and total count. Let's, look, let's start with total count. With total count, all we are doing is adding up how many responses we recorded, and then we're taking the smaller number and dividing it by the bigger number. So if I record 10 responses, you record 12, we add those up and we divide them. It's a very straightforward IOA procedure. It is not the strictest. And then we have trial by trial. With trial by trial, we are typically just looking at did we record a response or did we not for a trial? Again, not very strict. So that leaves us with mean count and exact count for interval. And you can see they're very similar, except one, we're just looking at an average. So with mean count per interval, what we're going to do is we're going to break our data collection into intervals. And then we're going to take a smaller over the bigger number per interval and get a percentage. And then we're going to add those up and we're going to find the average count per interval. Now that's pretty strict, but what's even more strict is the exact count per interval. Because with exact count, we are going to take precisely how many data points were recorded and compare them to each other. And it's only IOA if they match. So the strategy that's going to be strictest is going to be exact count per interval. All right. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.